And if I only could, I'd make a deal with God. Oh my God, hey, welcome back to my theater themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theater. I'm a professional theater critic here on YouTube. I'm also a social media content creator. And I recently went to go and see the brand new Stranger Things play, The First Shadow, which has just opened at the Phoenix Theater in London's West End. And y'all, before I even start talking about this show and telling you everything that you may want to know about it as well as my thoughts uh, and my kind of like theatrical perspective on whether or not this is a good piece of theatre aside from its relationship to the Stranger Things canon we need to talk about this program because it wasn't until I held this up by the side of my head that I realized I'm having to move over and share the frame with this can we discuss how big these programs are getting value for money sure absolutely but there is there is no need for this program to be this big. This is my head for comparison. This is ridiculous. Like the Americans who are literally flying over to the UK right now exclusively to see this play are going to have to buy new luggage to get it back to the US with them. Anyway, yes, there is a brand new play set within the universe of the very popular Netflix series, Stranger Things. It is technically a prequel to the show taking place basically an entire generation before the first season, but referencing events that we come to learn about specifically largely in the show's most recent fourth season and allegedly the plot of this play is integral to the upcoming fifth and final season. I will let you know my verdict on whether I think that actually is the case in today's video. But if you don't know me, if you're meeting me for the first time, I am a professional theatre critic. I review shows that I get invited to go and see in the West End. I travelled to Broadway a couple times this year. I also went to Brazil and Paris. I basically try and see as much theatre as I can and then I come on here and make videos about it and I spend so much time seeing theatre, I don't get to watch nearly as much television as I would like to. And normally when I am sitting down to watch TV, I'm watching either Disney vlogs or The Real Housewives of somewhere because I need my brain to switch off from all of the hard hitting theatre I've been seeing. So I was very late to the Stranger Things train, but because I knew this play was coming, I started watching the first season about a month ago. And then time kind of crept up on me and suddenly I had a week until I was seeing the play and I had only watched the first season. So I watched the second, third, and fourth seasons of this show, which are all about eight or nine episodes, and the last one, very long episodes, like hour and a half, two hours, some of them. I watched those within six days. Specifically on the day I went to see Stranger Things The First Shadow, I watched the last four episodes and then like ran onto a train to go and see it. Which I think set me up in the best possible way to A, be really excited about this show and be really immersed in all of the Stranger Things lore and that anticipation of it compared with the fans who had seen this years ago and had been waiting a really long time for more Stranger Things. But also it put all of the events of the show within my very recent memory. So it gave me very good insight as to kind of the continuity between the television series and the play. So that's something I'm going to talk about in this as well. I'm going to give you a synopsis of the play. You can skip over that if you don't want spoilers. I am then going to talk about what I liked about this play. I'm going to talk about some of its shortcomings. We're going to talk about the performances. We're going to talk about the continuity and we're going to talk about what this means for the Stranger Things universe. If you're a theatre fan who doesn't know Stranger Things and wants to know about this play, then you're in the right place. If you're a Stranger Things fan who isn't going to get the chance to see this play and wants to learn more about about it, then I will hopefully be able to help you as well. In any case, if you enjoy today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel for many more videos coming very soon. If anything else exciting happens with the Stranger Things play, then I will make more video content about it right here on YouTube. But I will also hopefully be reviewing all of the most exciting shows in the West End and on Broadway next year, so make sure you're subscribed for that as well. Finally, if you are lucky enough to have been one of the few audience members who has already seen the Stranger Things play in the West End, comment with your spoiler-free thoughts in the comments section down below. And while you're doing that, we will begin. Let's talk about Stranger Things The First Shadow. So some context then. If, like me, you are a theatre person and you're not familiar with it, Stranger Things was a 2016 American sci-fi slash horror TV show created for the streaming platform Netflix by the Duffer Brothers. It follows multiple generations living within the fictional town of Hawkins, Indiana, who find themselves in proximity 
to this otherworldly dimension. It attracted record viewership on the platform, it's critically acclaimed, it's multi-award winning, and it cleverly and uh, nostalgically pays homage to all of these 1980s horror and sci-fi films. In just the most recent series, there were a lot of references to Stephen King's Carrie, to Nightmare on Elm Street. In older seasons, you had uh, moments paying reference visually to like E.T. But the play is set years previously to the events of the TV show. It takes place in Hawkins, Indiana in 1959 and has been written by Kate Treffrey, one of the writers for the TV show, and is based on a story that has been developed by Kate in conjunction with the Duffer Brothers and playwright Jack Thorne. So let's talk about Jack first of all. Jack, as well as having written the recent hit play at the National Theatre, The Motive and the Cue, which is imminently going to be moving into the Noel Coward Theatre in the West End. Jack is no stranger to this kind of theatrical genre of adapting these massive and very popular intellectual properties to the stage because he is also the playwright behind Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. But Harry Potter, which is still playing at the Palace Theatre, just slightly down the Charing Cross Road from the Phoenix Theatre where Stranger Things is, was this huge hit. When it first opened, it swept the Olivier Awards, it transferred to Broadway where it is still playing at the Lyric Theatre in New York. It's about to be licensed for school productions. It's embarking on a North American tour. It was hugely successful. And it will be very interesting to see whether the Stranger Things play goes on to achieve similar levels of success. You know, Stranger Things is very popular. I don't know if it has the same kind of intergenerational massive popularity that something like a Harry Potter had. But much like Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, Stranger Things on stage combines visual spectacle and these really impressive staging elements with nods to the original franchise and Easter eggs for fans and performances that are familiar of on-screen characterizations as well as exciting new plot twists and developments. So in this next section I'm going to give you a sense of the synopsis of the play. I'm not going to tell you every single detail but if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever you should skip this and head to the following chapter. So this is the part where I tell you which of the beloved characters from the TV show feature in the play. Because like I said, this is set in Hawkins, Indiana in 1959, which specifically uh, coincides with the arrival of the Creel family. Now, if you're wondering how much Stranger Things you need to see in order to get all of these references, I think the episode you need to get to is season four, episode seven. There are nine episodes in season four. The last is cinematic in length. But in season seven, we get this substantial flashback that explains the character of Henry Creel, who, spoiler alert, I've warned you, we find out in that moment is also the show's overall antagonist, Vecna. But in 1959, he is just a child, arriving to Hawkins, Indiana, with his family, his parents and his sister. Now, this taking place a generation before the TV show, all of the parent characters that we know from the regular seasons are all in high school in this version. We have young Joyce, we have young Hopper, we have Hopper's dad, who himself is Chief Hopper within the play. So Hopper goes on to follow in his footsteps. I've said Hopper too many times at this point. We have young Karen. I had to think about her name then because I always refer to her as Milfy Mrs. Nancy. She's Karen Childress in the play because that's her maiden name. She goes on to be Karen Wheeler. Her future husband, Ted Wheeler, is her boyfriend during the play. Similarly, Joyce is known to us in the play as Joyce Maldonado because she's not yet married, but she is already dating the slightly older Lonnie Byers, who she's already divorced by the first season of Stranger Things. Alan Munson features in the play. I believe he's Eddie's dad, right? We're going to talk about this a little bit later on. We have basically cameo appearances from Claudia Yunt and Walter Henderson, who go on to be Dustin's parents. Also Sue Anderson and Charles Sinclair, who go on to be Lucas and Erica's parents. We have a younger version of the mysterious and sinister Dr. Brenner, of course, played by Matthew Modine in the TV show. He's played by Patrick Vale in the play. And we have a young version of Sean Astin's character, Bob Newby. Now, his father features in the play. At one point, they were going to make him a religious pastor, but that clearly changed during the play's development because he eventually became Principal Newby. And there's another member of their family who is brand new for this stage play. Play, and that is Bob's adopted sister, Patty. 
Now, Patty Newby is integral to the plot of this play because what happens here is we have Henry Creel arriving to this new school, having just moved to town, and he strikes up a friendship with Patty Newby that soon develops into something slightly more. And as he struggles to navigate sinister visions and voices, she reassures him that he has more control over this than he thinks he does, and that he can sort of steer these abilities towards a more positive place. She's also very excited when and Henry promises to try and use his supernatural abilities to try and help her locate her birth mother. But decidedly less enthusiastic about all of this are Henry's parents, who, prior to having even moved to Hawkins, Indiana, know that something is very wrong with their son. Henry and his mother have formed a very cold and confrontational relationship, and his father is a little bit more oblivious to the severity of the situation, but as things escalate, uh, Virginia Creel, who is Henry's mother, calls in support from Dr. Brenner and his team. And this is when he takes Henry to the lab that we will recognize from season one. It's during one of their conversations there that Dr. Brenner confides that his father, who was a sea captain during the war, was involved in this accident during a scientific experiment when he was briefly transported to a different dimension. This is something that we saw in the prologue of the play. We see this big ship getting sent to the Upside Down. We see a Demogorgon, like you can see behind me, in the smoke on stage. This is kind of the only time that we see one. There was another encounter with the Demogorgon in the play, but it was cut during previews. And largely what happens with Dr. Brenner and Henry and the Creels plays out in the way that you will already know it does because you've already seen it in the TV show. Some of those scenes that feature in flashbacks in season four, episode seven, are literally recreated exactly on stage. What's new is this other plot happening simultaneously at the high school. Now, the way that Joyce and Hopper and all of the other characters factor into all of this is Joyce is trying to gain an art scholarship so that she can get out of Hawkins and go and make something of herself. And so she's trying to wrangle all of her peers and direct the school play which is where we have cameo appearances from all of the other parents from the series. We have Karen modifying her outfit to make it a little bit more sexy. We have Ted being relatively useless. Bob, unsurprisingly, is very enthusiastic. We can see early on that he has this unrequited adoration for Joyce. We can also see early chemistry between Joyce and Hopper. They flirt, but it doesn't really come to anything. This is very familiar from the TV series where they've been doing this for literally four seasons. Seasons now. And you guessed it, Patty Newby and Henry Creel end up being cast as basically leading love interests in the play. A lot of which mirrors the drama and intensity of their real life circumstances. And that I think is as much of the synopsis as I want to tell you. It's one of these sort of villainous origin stories where he's feeling this love and he's trying to make good choices but sort of ends up being doomed by it all which is a villainous backstory i feel like we've seen multiple times before and ultimately quite a lot of this play is not actually going to be news to you as stranger things fans because the entirety of the arc of the creel family is contained within the tv show I should add as well that we do have a little bit of Scooby Gang going on with Joyce and Hopper and Bob teaming up to try and work out what's going on because a lot of local pets are being mysteriously killed by being levitated into the air and having their limbs snapped. Sound familiar? Of course it does. But there's so much I'm itching to tell you about the way that this play actually works and what I think about it. So let's do that next. Let me tell you what I thought of Stranger Things The First Shadow. Okay, so the overview is that I found this to be a little bit disappointing, because I think in comparison with the TV series, which I'll remind you I binge watched in the week leading up to this, it was a little bit inconsequential, and a lot of the cleverness of the series wasn't really reflected in the writing of the play. Because what they do very well on Netflix is manage to balance the levity and comedy of these younger characters and their pubescent relationships and their worldview with the gravity and the seriousness of the supernatural situations in which they find themselves and the horror element. You have the drama and this comedy balanced very well. And there was an attempt to do that with the stage play, but I'm not sure that they really achieved fully 
on either front because I didn't think it was nearly as menacing or as dark or as heavy as it could have been when it was trying to be. And in those lighter scenes, I didn't think it was as funny as it could have been. I thought it tended more towards silliness than finding sort of these organic fun and charming moments between its younger characters. I'm going to be specific about plenty of details, but first of all, I want to tell you what I did enjoy about this play. We're going to start with the positives. So there is this opening prologue sequence where, without telling you what happens, it is hugely visually impressive. It's a little over-reliant throughout the play on this screen coming down and then raising back up, but some of the settings that they are able to create, the way that they transport us to different locations, familiar of the TV series, using lighting, using effects within the auditorium, using an immense amount of haze, very impressive. The projection mapping that they use on this large set piece in the first few moments of the play, very impressive. And there are a lot of other very impressive sort of small scale visual effects throughout the rest of the play. We see some clever levitation, some really slick swapping out of body doubles so that actors can appear in unexpected places. One of the most impressive effects was when we had these jars open themselves and spiders were crawling out of them. That was brilliant. There are a couple of traumatizing things that happen to animals, again, very convincingly portrayed on stage. But none of these I felt were really pushing the boundaries of what we've already achieved with onstage visual effects. To say how long ago Harry Potter and the Cursed Child was, there's nothing really being achieved in this that felt truly cutting edge or new. And I found myself wanting a little bit more speed and a little bit more terror with some of those moments as well, for them to feel really threatening and urgent and like blood quickening. Another positive, I think by and large, the way that these characters are written are very familiar of their on-screen counterparts, but at a younger age, there were a couple of people that I thought the characterization didn't quite fully line up, but for most of them, the way that young Jim Hopper has been written and the way that a lot of the parents have been written, they are absolutely what you would expect them to be as teenagers. And for diehard fans of the series, just getting to see Joyce and Hopper interacting in high school is reason enough to go and see this play. Getting to see young Bob is so charming, is so sweet, is so much fun. Young Henry Creel, as unnerving, as sinister as you would expect. We're meeting Dr. Brenner as a younger, more aggressive man before his resolve had been softened a little by raising all of the different children that he raises. Eleven kids will do that to a person. I do like that they have this play within a play because I think that's a good 1950s equivalent of the Dungeons and Dragons game that they are playing in the 80s that kind of parallels the monster hunt and the battling that they end up actually doing and the play and the plot of the play talks about this darkness and talks about this malevolence and so it mirrors it in the same way that the D&D stuff does. I think that's clever. I really like the design of the proscenium and they use this in some clever ways throughout. Really everything visual going on, the amount of set that they used, we don't get full naturalistic sets throughout. There is a very well utilized revolve. Oh God, the way they use that to create the police station, very clever the way that they use it in the high school scenes. Really everything about this set design, I absolutely enjoyed. This was by Miriam Butha and it's been directed by the masterful Stephen Doldry with Justin Martin. And so the slickness of the production, the balancing of tone, the skill of that really comes as no surprise. As, as far as the entire creative team goes, I have no complaints, I have no criticisms. My principal criticisms lie with the story, the conceit of the show, the concept and the writing. So let me talk now about some of the show's shortcomings and why it left me feeling disappointed. So even if I didn't already know that Jack Thorne was involved in creating the story for this, I would have been able to tell instantly because it's so familiar of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child and sort of the scope that that story has. This has less time because as that was originally conceived, the Harry Potter play, it was a two-part play that was basically four acts long, and this is shorter. It's still a long play. It was still three hours when I saw it, but it's shorter than that. Before people comment, I do know that the Harry Potter play has been condensed 
into just the one play, just two acts in New York. I have no idea how you condense two plays into one, but it's happened. My point is, they both feel a little bit like fan fiction. And this whole idea of like, what if all of their parents happened to all be in the same year at high school at the same time, and they were all friends with each other, and they all had to solve this mystery that they have never once spoken about in the show, other than when their children have to go and look up newspaper reports of what happened at the time. Bear with me, we're going to talk about the continuity of all of it later. It just feels a little bit like juvenile fan fiction to me. Like, we could have come up with a more interesting backstory. And had they utilised more characters that we don't meet later on in the Stranger Things universe, then more consequential things could have happened to them. But we don't have the threat that we have in the TV series because we know that the majority of these characters aren't going anywhere. We know that they are not expendable because we meet them years later in the show. We know that Joyce is not going to get killed when there is a tense exchange with Henry Creel because we'd see her two kids later being played by Winona Ryder. And once again, the majority of the play's most dramatic scenes we have already seen playing out in season four, episode seven of Stranger Things. They literally recreate them on stage shot for shot except where they could utilize the play's dramatic potential to expand on those scenes, they don't because we have this moment, spoilers from the TV show, spoilers from the play, you've been warned, where Henry Creel, who wants to punish his mother, lifts her up off of her chair during a dinner, snaps her limbs, and then kills her in front of the rest of his family. This being the first of the Creel family murders that his father, Victor Creel, is shortly afterwards imprisoned for, and the catalyst for Henry being taken to the facility by Dr. Brenner. Now, I was hoping that we would get to see the dinner table exchange that immediately led into this moment. What is the last thing that Henry and his mother said to each other, causing him to snap and do this? Was it in the heat of some sort of passionate exchange, or was it completely cold and sinister? Had he been planning it? We come to understand his motivations for doing it at the time, and feeling betrayed by his mother, but we don't get to see the scene leading into it. Instead, we have a double version of Henry at the back of the stage, and we have Henry narrating to the audience, talking about this event which to him had happened in the past or was going to happen. It's unclear as to his relationship to that moment, but we see it playing out in the background, which is kind of the same way we experience it in the TV show. We are divorced from the intensity of that moment, and it looks terrifying, but we don't really feel the impact of it because we're not actually in that scene. It's an aside. And the actor playing Henry himself is not present in that scene either. He is soliloquizing while his mother gets killed behind him. It doesn't feel as much like he is killing members of his own family. We don't feel the brutality of that, I don't think. And the effect itself, which is created using a doll, is upstaged by the fact that Henry has shortly before lifted someone else up into the stage, which was very cool and impressive because that's the first time we saw that, but it, it lessens the impact when we see it again almost immediately afterwards. Here is another substantial spoiler. Massive spoiler for the play. I want to talk about the character of Patty Newby. So Patty, we immediately come to recognize as this deeply tragic heroine. She doesn't have many friends, no one she can really really turn to. She is treated cruelly by her father, and she finds a sort of a kindred spirit in Henry. But in this kind of Curly's wife type of a way, we can see the writing on the wall for her, and we know that it's not going to end well. We know who he goes on to become, and we know that this is a love that is doomed from the beginning. Except that for whatever reason, it's not. And even though at the end of the play, Dr. Brenner goads Henry into using his power and embracing the darkness and collapsing the rain catwalk that Patty is standing on while she is performing in the school play, causing her to fall from a great height. She doesn't die. She survives this, and then we get this little epilogue moment where she goes to find her mother. And my only assumption is that she must be enduringly relevant for season five of the show, because there's no other reason why she shouldn't really die by his own hand, completing his villainous backstory, making him this character who destroys everything that he has ever loved loved with his own malevolence. Now speaking of that, in the TV show, he is very much portrayed as this evil child who did everything by his own choice. But in the stage play, we have this very big difference in how that is depicted. 
because we see him struggling against the control of what is presumed to be the Mind Flayer, another supernatural presence that we come to recognize during the TV show. And according to the stage play, he doesn't necessarily want to be doing all of these evil things, but he is increasingly under the control of the Mind Flayer, which sort of absolves him from the evil of all of this and makes him this corrupted character rather than an inherently malicious one, which lessens his impact as a villain, I think. Henry Creel has never been presented that way. It draws an interesting comparison with Will in Stranger Things, because he's someone who tried to resist the control of the Mind Flayer, while Henry gives into it comparatively easily, albeit with very bad adult influences in his life, notably Dr. Brenner. But I don't know if I liked what that choice turned Henry Creel as a character into. I think I preferred it when he was just an evil child. I have a bunch more I can say about this play. I'm not going to list every single issue that I have with it, but broadly, I don't think it captures the same cleverness as the TV show. I don't see it referencing all of the same kind of clever things that the TV show does. I don't see it pulling on those different references. I don't think it really evokes the late 1950s in the same way that the TV show evokes the 80s. The costuming is really good and on point, but it doesn't reference late 1950s sci-fi and horror media in the way that you would expect it to. I don't think they use music as cleverly or as inspirationally as the TV show does either. They feature the song Dream a Little Dream of Me, which we already knew was integral to the Creel backstory. It also uses that song a lot that I know, I know you belong to somebody new. Because it's creepy, but I think they could use music more effectively. If I may talk briefly about the Demogorgon that we see at the beginning, it is quite clearly just a person in a Demogorgon costume and it looks a little bit naff to me. And I don't think that's because of the character design, I think that's because of the way that it's staged. Because we have this ship on stage surrounded by haze for a really long time, we gather that we're in the Upside Down, and we see this Demogorgon just start to kind of waddle out, and then we just kind of see it in the haze being like one of those inflatable things outside of a garage that's kind of waving its arms around. And I think if we were to see like a big silhouette of it, or even if it was to appear suddenly in the aisle, they do utilize people in the aisles. There are no monsters in the aisles, but we have people in hazmat suits walking through the aisles at one point, which is like sinister, but not scary. That I think would have been more effective. Now the first production image that the show released was an encounter that Henry Creel had with a Demogorgon when he finds himself transported to a different dimension. And this is meant to suggest at his origin as Vector. It is meant to explain how he gains his supernatural abilities. And for this to be such a pivotal scene and the kind of thing that would answer more questions we have from the TV show rather than just kind of fleshing out what we already know and providing a little bit of atmosphere and color around the existing flashbacks we've already seen, I'm surprised that they cut this scene. It feels like this is really pivotal to what they're trying to tell us with this play. All in all, I'm hard pressed to work out why this is meant to be so important for season five and it doesn't feel like must see viewing. I know a lot of fans worldwide are very frustrated that this is only on in London and it's being suggested that you have to go and see this play to have questions answered and otherwise you won't understand season five. I can't imagine that there is anything they're going to depict in season five that they wouldn't provide you with a little flashback. Even if Patty Newby and her mother appear in season five, I feel like they will do a little bit of a flashback. I really don't think they're going to be relying on people having seen this play that's currently only in London. Not least of all because there is barely anything new that it tells us that we didn't already know. For this to be calling itself an all new Stranger Things story, it is, it is largely nothing new. But I've started talking about continuity, so let me talk entirely about this and see if you can help me with some questions here, because I'm confused. So I watched all of Stranger Things super recently. I wouldn't call myself a diehard fan and there are definitely bigger Stranger Things experts than I. So maybe I've misinterpreted some of this and there are gonna be spoilers about both the TV show and the play in this section. If you don't want spoilers, don't watch this bit. But the whole origin story of Henry Creel is explained in the play as basically everyone was in Nevada before they were in Hawkins, like Dr. Brenner and 
all of the science stuff that they were doing, that was in Nevada. The Creel family, they were in Nevada. Patty Newby's mother is now in Nevada. Like, Nevada is apparently the place to be. But while Brenner and his team were doing science things over in Nevada because his dad went to the Upside Down on a boat once and then he became obsessed with it. Someone ran off with some sort of special device. Henry Creel came upon this device in the desert and then went missing for a bunch of hours. In a now removed scene from the play, he is transported to a different dimension where he encounters a Demogorgon. Does this not step on the toes of when he actually gets sent to a different dimension by Eleven when he kills all of the other children and he tries to kill her but she retaliates and uses the strength of her powers to send him to the upside down and he seemed to be in that moment experiencing it for the first time. Would the idea of him already having gone to a different dimension not kind of interfere with that? I'd have to watch the episode back, but I feel like he also spoke about that being the first time he went to the Upside Down, so he couldn't have gone there as a child. The other big continuity thing that isn't an issue yet, but is about to be, is all of the characters who now exist as parents within Stranger Things on TV all canonically met Henry Creel when he was a student in the same year as them, it seems, at high school. Like Joyce directed him in a play. They all suspected his father, Victor Creel, of being guilty of these local murders. They all absolutely knew who he was. And now we have seen on TV that the kids have all learned the name Henry Creel and they have now been reunited with Joyce and with Hopper. So if immediately in season five, we don't see Joyce and Hopper like being shocked by the fact that their former since disappeared classmate Henry Creel turned out to be the evil one all along, then that is a big continuity error. There's also a very weird time jump. I'm willing to just call this laziness, but at the end of the play, we flash forwards a couple of years. We see Joyce working as a waitress. We see Hopper about to go to war. Joyce is not old enough yet to have had children, but that time jump gets actually signposted and they tell us that it's a time jump. We then cut to a scene with Henry Creel and Dr. Brenner when he's introducing Henry to Eleven. Uh, who is like the age that we meet Eleven as in the show. So there is clearly another time jump that happens there. They just don't tell us that it's a time jump. The final scene of Patty Newby also left me confused because she goes and meets her mother based on instructions that Henry had given her because she survived this fall that very much made it look like she had died because everyone like didn't go and help her. They just like stood in horror and like Joyce said to Bob, her adoptive brother, Bob, I'm so sorry. And then we see newspaper flashes to say that she mysteriously disappeared thereafter, but she goes to find her mother. And when she reunites with her mother, there are flickering lights, which we know to mean the presence of Vecna or someone in the Upside Down nearby or Vecna using his powers. And I don't know what that is suggesting. Is that suggesting that Henry is following her, keeping an eye on her? Because at this point he has been taken into the custody of Dr. Brenner, who pretty sharply puts the thing in his neck to inhibit the use of his powers. So would he be able to do the flashing light stuff, or are we implying that Patty Newby has powers herself? And this is why she had a little bit more insight into Henry's relationship to his powers. I don't know. There's a question mark there. I saw someone else saying online that she seemed as though she was scared of the flashing lights. What I took from it was that she seemed oddly at ease with the flashing lights because she reassured her mother it was probably just an electrical failure but I was like is there something behind the eyes there does Patty Newby know more than she's letting on I don't know also let's not even acknowledge the fact that Bob never talked about the fact that he had an adoptive sister or that his father was the victim of this supernatural seeming attack. And when the string of very distinctive killings start happening in season four of Stranger Things, nobody in the town seems to connect them to the very similar killings that happened when they were all in high school. Literally all of their pets got killed that same way. There's also question marks in my mind about the Mind Flayer, because how is it that the Mind Flayer has access to Henry Creel in the first place? Where is the open game? that allows this to be possible. I mean, clearly something's going on because we had this boat in the prologue that got sent to the Upside Down, so 
evidently open gate somewhere sending boats through. My final continuity question is about Max Harwood's character, Alan Munson, because he is depicted as this very flamboyant, possibly queer coded drama geek character who is this like method actor who is really stuck into his role. But I believe he's playing Eddie Munson's dad, right? Like Alan Munson, I believe was canonically Eddie Munson's father, who we get told in the Stranger Things TV show was this crook. And so it, it really doesn't seem cohesive with the version of him that we've found out about later. Like this drama geek is gonna go on and do a bunch of crimes. Like unless scene stealing is illegal, then I don't see this, I don't see this kid going to prison anytime soon. If you have explanations for any of these questions, feel free to put them in the comment section down below. Just make sure you flag your comments using spoiler warnings. For now, I'm gonna carry on and we're going to talk about the performances of this cast. So Louis McCartney is terrific as Henry Creel. He does a really great job of grappling with these sinister tendencies that are rising in him with the rage that he's feeling, with all of the conflict. You can see the effect that Patty has on him. You can see him warming to her. You see that side of him as well. It's a very nuanced, very layered, very multi-dimensional performance. It's chilling and menacing and villainous when it's it needs to be, but also believably confused and terrified and young. Ella Karuna Williams as Patty has comparatively fewer notes to play, but boy does she play them very well. She does this whole tragic, charming heroine thing excellently. Now, Isabella Pappas, Oscar Lloyd, and Christopher Buckley have very challenging jobs here because they have to play young Joyce, young Hopper, and young Bob. Beloved characters from the TV show who have had very distinctive on-screen portrayals. And so they have to come up with characterizations that are familiar, but they have to extrapolate it to the teenage versions of those characters. Christopher Buckley as Bob probably does the best job here. He is incredibly endearing and charming and funny and hugely familiar of Sean Astin's portrayal in the TV series. Oscar Lloyd probably looks the least like a young Hopper, which maybe inhibits the familiarity just a little bit, but I still buy him as the teenage version of this character. I like the way he plays his sort of strained relationship with his dad, also very well portrayed by Shane Atwell. Isabella Pappas, I really enjoy her performance in this show, and there are definitely shades of Joyce. You see her hysterical frustration, but in the TV series, that really only comes out when she's getting really passionate. Until she has to be, she's quite passive, and she's more of a people pleaser. So for her to be so feisty and outspoken and constantly assertive in the stage play isn't completely familiar of the Joyce that we know from the TV series. Now you could argue that she becomes more like that over the time, probably more like that in the relationship with Lonnie as he kind of dulls her flame a little bit. And you see a lot of Winona Ryder in Isabella's performance. I really just think it's the way that she's written that frames Joyce just a, just a little away from where I would be expecting her. Of the other high school students that we meet, Max Harwood is an absolute standout. He is very funny as Alan Munson. He's very charismatic. Patrick Vale is someone I would like to see more of in this play. We don't get that much Dr. Brenner and the way that he's been written, I also find a little bit confusing. It kind of reminds me of the issues that I have with Dumbledore's character in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child because it's someone who doesn't feel familiar of the version of them that we've come to know. Now you can try and extrapolate as to why Dr. Brenner might make different choices and might be a slightly different type of a character years previously in this stage play, but he's very aggressive and sort of bloodthirsty in the way that he treats Henry with no caution whatsoever. And he ends up wreaking a certain amount of chaos and havoc. And there's not enough in the script for us to know whether that was his intention or whether he's just being completely careless in his treatment of Henry and this is all unintentional. The intensity that Patrick Vale portrays, however, per the script and per the direction is fantastic. He does a wonderful job. He's a great actor as are Michael Gibson and Lauren Ward, who play Victor and Virginia Creel, Henry's parents, who I would go as far as to say are both wasted in this production because they really only get to play this kind of like 
concern and despair and hysteria, but they don't have nearly enough scenes in which to do that. Lauren Ward gets slightly more material and she gets slightly more than in the TV show. Michael Gibson gets less than Victor Creel actually already had in the TV show, so he feels really hard done by by this script. But considering we already knew what this family dynamic was going to be, I think I just wanted more. I wanted to see the Creel family prior to even moving to Hawkins, Indiana, because I feel like that is where more unanswered questions Questions lie. I wanted to see their dynamic amongst the four of them rather than Henry going to school, rather than us getting the fan service thing where we tick off a million different characters from the TV show, but I get why they did that. Now at this point I've been talking for a really long time, but I think you start to get the idea of my feelings about this play. To summarize, I don't think that this is vital for any Stranger Things fan. I think a Stranger Things fan will enjoy this play because it's cool seeing these things on stage, seeing those characters that you know from the TV series, seeing younger versions of them, and it's fun. But it doesn't, I don't think the writing lives up to the strength of Stranger Things, and it tells us very little that we didn't already know. So for this to be portrayed as must-see viewing prior to season five, I don't understand. When season five comes out, we'll have more insight as to what that meant, but I cannot imagine anything will happen in season five that won't be adequately explained by just watching season five. Those have been my thoughts. Anyway, I would welcome other people's thoughts in the comment section down below. Make sure to make it clear if you are posting a spoiler for people watching this video who haven't seen the play yet. But I hope that you have enjoyed this one. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel for many more videos about theatre very soon. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>